Let me welcome back to the Stevens Roofing Newsmaker Hotline my very good friend and our Texas Senator, Ted Cruz, who happens to have a very close connection mm. to somebody in his life who knows a lot about Castro, who knows a lot about Cuba, and who knows a lot about the revolution. Senator, welcome back to the show this morning. Trey, good morning. Always good to be with you. So uh, your comments on Bernie Sanders sympathizing with Castro in Cuba. Well, sadly, it's nothing new. I mean, this has been a pattern of Bernie Sanders throughout his life. He, he lionizes, he glorifies, he pals around with left-wing communist dictators. So he's been praising Fidel Castro for 60 years. Uh, ever since Castro emerged from the mountains, executed the revolution, and began executing dissidents, Bernie has a blind eye to the suffering, to the torture, to the misery uh, that, that Castro has carried out. As you know, my father fought with Castro. My father was imprisoned and tortured by the Batista regime. And then my aunt, my tia Sonia, who was there after Castro succeeded, she fought the counter-revolution because the people of Cuba saw, just like Bernie Sanders, that all the false promises. You know, Castro actually campaigned like Bernie. He said, we'll have all free stuff. And then people discovered what that meant was jack boot boots and machine guns and the army controlling everything and no freedoms, no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion, no, no rights. And if you speak up, you get thrown in a hole, you get tortured. And, and Bernie, he won't speak for the dissidents. He won't speak for the, for the political prisoners. He won't speak for those being tortured and murdered by his buddies like, like Fidel Castro and Raul Castro in Cuba, his buddies – like, uh, like uh, Daniel Ortega, the communist dictator in Nicaragua, he's a, he, Bernie thinks he's great. Bernie thinks China's great. Bernie says, oh, communist China has alleviated so much suffering. You notice Bernie didn't mention the over one million Uyghurs right now in concentration camps today in China being tortured. Bernie gives a pass to all of the communist tyrants. And you know who Bernie doesn't like? Americans. Yeah. He doesn't actually, <laughs> when's the last time you heard him say something as nice about Abraham Lincoln right. as he says about Fidel Castro? Yeah, that's you a know, very good point. He doesn't like. He really doesn't like Israelis. Right, mm. right, yeah. right. Yeah, he's I, I, not I mean, going to APAC. Yeah, he would be the most anti-Israel president this country has ever seen. And, and one of the answers that was rather stunning, he refused to answer. Would you move the embassy, our embassy, back from Jerusalem? Would you take it out of Jerusalem? Would you shut it down and move it somewhere else? And he said, well, we'll have to consider that. He refused to answer. You know, for 40 years, the official position of virtually every Democrat in the Senate was that they supported moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Now, they didn't really. They were pretending, but they claimed to support that. When Donald Trump actually did it, you know, I, I was there when the embassy opened in Jerusalem. It was an incredible, powerful moment. Do you know how many Democratic members of Congress came to the event? Exactly zero. Zero. It was a round number. Not a single one of them was there. Uh, and now Bernie is – look, let, let there be no mystery. Bernie intends to, to shut down the embassy in Jerusalem. He all but said it when, when he I – mean, he didn't say the obvious answer – the, the press back was always, well, if you move the embassy, the Middle East will erupt in violence. It'll be terrible. There'll be terrorism. None of that's happened. So we now know all of those arguments are false. But why does Bernie st still plan to move the embassy? Because he hates the nation of Israel. His actions demonstrate antipathy when he calls APAC uh, a platform for bigotry. Um, it, it, it's interesting. He has never once that I've seen said anything remotely as critical about the Soviet Union. Oh, no. By the way, is where, where Bernie spent his honeymoon. Think about that. No. <laughs> Trey, Trey, Trey where would you spend your honeymoon? Uh, at Cor <laughs> Corpus Christi, Port A. A, a beautiful, fabulous place. And by the way, great answer for a radio audience. That, 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 <laughs> that, was, that was well done. That, that's not it's true. Talk about getting you a, 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 a 
softball. <laughs> it is true, man. I was in Port A with my wife. Nice. The Coral K condominiums, baby. I did it. I did it all right. It was, it was fifty-nine dollars a night. I remember it very well. Well, let me let me ask you about this because you're, you're you're absolutely right. You're just nailing it, and you're obviously very passionate about what you know. Uh, uh, Bernie Sanders is all about. I I, I was uh, on another matter. I was very satisfied once again to see that you and I are in lockstep together on the Sotomayor uh, comments. Uh, concerning yeah. the president, you said exactly what I said on the national show yesterday, uh, which is the president is right to be saying she ought to recuse herself because she's nuts about the president. It has no, it doesn't matter what appears before her on the Supreme Court. If Donald Trump is for it, she's going to be against it. Well, the problem we've seen over the last three years is is that there are some radical left wing judges who hate the president and who have decided they're effectively part of the resistance movement. So, so any time the Trump administration implements a new policy, almost whatever the policy is, within minutes, left-wing activist groups run to court, mm-hmm. left-wing attorney generals run to court, and they go find a federal judge, and mm-hmm. they go find a friendly federal judge who, who, who sees himself or herself as part of the resistance movement. And, and what they end up doing is issuing what are called nationwide injunctions. Now, these used to be quite rare. One district court, one individual judge in one district claiming that he – in joining, issuing an order to the United States to stop a policy all across the country. That's incredible power for one judge to have. It's also very rare. If you look at all eight years of the George W. Bush administration, in eight years the George W. Bush administration saw district courts issuing national injunctions 12 times. Under the Obama administration, in eight years, they saw district courts issuing national injunctions 19 times. Under Trump, in just three years, we have had federal district courts issuing national injunctions 55 times. Insane. 55. Mm. And so what is happening – so Justice Sotomayor last Friday wrote a dissent complaining it's just terrible that the Department of Justice keeps seeking – emergency appeals to the Supreme Court. It's even worse. Supreme Court keeps granting them. So she's blasting her colleagues. She's blasting the president. Mm-hmm. By the way, no other justice of the Supreme Court joins her opinion. She writes that just for herself. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the irony is, look, the reason she, she's complaining that there are too many emergency appeals without taking a moment to reflect, well, what's the emergency? The emergency is that you've got lawless judicial activist judges over and over and over again issuing nationwide injunctions. And it's not based on the law. It's not based on the Constitution. It's based on the fact that they hate the president and they oppose his policies. And so those emergencies are meriting the Supreme Court getting involved to stop the judicial lawlessness that we're seeing. Uh, Senator, it's it's Sean Rima. Uh, I just want to ask you a quick question, kind of going back to this idea of socialism with Bernie Sanders and really in general with all of the candidates. Um, Trey and I were talking about this about a minute ago that, you know, you look at the numbers uh, as far as young people who are positive towards socialism. We kind of gave our ideas, but why, why do you why do you see what do you think that trend is about? Uh, I think it's several things. Number one, I think far too many of our schools suck. <laughs> hey, yes. we'll just leave it right there. <laughs> Interview <laughs> over. Have a good day. <laughs> well, I got a feeling we'll hear that sound later in the show. <laughs> you know how many votes you just got? You know how many votes you just sealed up for, for a lifetime? Awesome. Look, they, they, they don't teach our kids anything. And by the way, it's also, Sean, it's your fa- failure and my failure. Mm. Yeah. We're not educating young people. So, so I get if you're a 20-something and, you know, you're in college and, and by the way, you're a beneficiary of socialism at that moment because mom and dad are paying all the bills. I, I get how it's really appealing to, to, to have, have for free stuff. Mm-hmm. Free yeah. stuff sounds good in, mm-hmm. in the history of mankind. People have liked free stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, Margaret Thatcher put it very, very well when Margaret Thatcher said the problem with socialism Mm -hmm. is eventually you run out of other people's money. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And and too many of the young people don't understand. Here's a simple fact. Everywhere on earth, socialism has been implemented. It has been a failure. It has brought poverty and misery and suffering and death. Let's go back to Cuba. Cuba is a socialist country. Let's look at what happened. In 1959, 
Cuba was the number one sugar producer in the world. There was there was significant prosperity in Cuba. Now, Batista, the dictator, was corrupt and oppressive. There wasn't there wasn't individual freedom, but there was economic prosperity. Castro came in. He brought socialism, destroyed the economy of that country, brought crushing poverty to that country. So much so, you know, you know, Ronald Reagan had a great way of putting it during the Cold War. He said the thing that liberals never seem to notice is on the Berlin Wall, the machine guns all point in one direction. That's right. That's exactly you know, right. People vote vote with their feet. You didn't see anyone from West Germany saying, I got to live me in some communist East Germany. It was right. right there. It wasn't too far away. Yeah. But nobody went to do that. The, the way I like to put it as a Cuban-American is is the thing that, that, that Hollywood liberals never seem to notice is – from Cuba, the rafts are all going in one. That's place. exactly right. Mm. Exactly. Just once, I'd like to see one of these Hollywood liberals go down to Key West, get an inflatable raft, and go the other way. Ninety miles south. Hey, you know what? Uh, you could take Rob Reiner, Meathead, and put him on one today, and I wouldn't miss him at all. That'd you'd, be just you'd need a bigger boat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you would. All right, real quick, real quick, because we are out of time. We're way behind on time. Let me get you to touch on coronavirus quickly. Listen, it's very serious, and, 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 and it's getting worse. Uh, to date, that we know of, more than 80,000 people have been in, infected by the virus. Um, we know of at least 2,700 people uh, who have died as a result of the virus. What makes those numbers all the more disturbing is most of those numbers are coming out of China, and we know that communist China often lies. So the numbers could be much worse. We don't have full transparency. <laughs> I am next week chairing a hearing. I chair the Aviation and Space Subcommittee, the Commerce Committee. I'm chairing a hearing on the coronavirus, bringing in the CDC, bringing in Health and Human Services, bringing, bringing in the FAA uh, to discuss commercial air travel. The president has wisely halted commercial air travel to China until we, until we get a handle on this virus. But it is a very serious threat, and, and we need to do everything reasonably possible uh, to try to prevent a pandemic, because, because this this is dangerous. All right. Senator Ted Cruz, as always, it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Take care. God bless.